T72 has been in service for almost 50 years and is still in service all around the world, so it is not uncommon to find some myths surrounding this vehicle. In this video, I will try to bust some of the more common myths surrounding this tank. You can play as one of many nations operating the T72 tank in Conflict of Nations. Conflict of Nations is a free online PvP strategy game. Choose a real country to lead in a modern global warfare and fight up to 128 other players in real time in games that can take weeks to complete. Use many different units to build your army, declare war to your neighbors or forge alliances with other players. Choose your own strategy, engage in epic battles and take over the world. One thing I like about the game is that it's a long-term real-time strategy game. One great thing is that you can play with the same account on both PC and mobile. Click on the link in the description to get an exclusive gift, 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. The offer is only available for 30 days, almost time. Myth number 1. T-72 Autoloader is famous for chopping off arms of the crew. Honestly, it baffles me people still believe this one today. I don't know where and how the myth started, but it couldn't be further from the truth. First of all, the gun breech has shields on each side which prevent the crew from accidentally moving in between the gun breech and the autoloader's elevator, making it completely safe to operate from their positions, since they are isolated from the autoloader. Second reason why it's close to impossible to happen is because the period where you can get your hand or arm chopped off is extremely short. You see, the only way for that to happen would be to put your arm between the charge or the projectile just before it gets pushed into the breach. On top of having really narrow space between the two, you would need to do it really fast. As you can see in this clip, it takes only a fraction of a second for the projectile or the charge to get pushed in from the moment they are brought into the level of the gun breach. Third reason is that the entire process takes time while the crew is operating in their own positions. Once the gun is fired, the commander either looks to confirm the kill or searches for the new target, while the gunner keeps his eyes on the target or starts looking for the next one too, but usually the dust takes longer to settle than it takes to load the gun, therefore the gunner, at least, would still be looking at the target he fired at to confirm if the threat has been neutralized. So, in conclusion, you would have to really reach out of your station in a fraction of a second and put your arm or hand between the charge or the projectile, while you're supposed to be doing something completely different. Now, I know some of you might say that something like that can happen while doing maintenance or clearing a malfunction, but official regulation calls for the outloader to be shut down and for the brake to be engaged while it is being operated on. The only instance it could happen is if during the maintenance the regulation wasn't followed and you somehow, I don't know how, turn on the rammer of the outloader only, which is close to impossible to happen. I have tried looking up for some reports on Russian, English, etc, but I could find nothing but some people saying how the autoloaders eat arms with no basis whatsoever. Myth number two. You have to be really short to be a T-72 tanker. Well, this one may or may not be true to some people. In Russia at least, the required height is not more than 175 centimeters, or shorter than 150 centimeters. This is the average male height in Russia and it is well above average for the entire world. Although the exceptions can actually be made. You see, I have spoken to a Serbian M84 driver in person on a military exhibition, and based on my height, he was well above 175 meters tall. I would personally say around 180 or even more. So I did some digging and it appears that Yugoslavia and then its separated states don't really have a proper height regulation. People that served on the M84 and T-72 tanks say that, although uncommon, there were tankers in their units that were, well, over 1.8 meters tall. But it is said that the gunners are much preferred to be short, because that position is cramped, and if you were taller you would be uncomfortable. So taller people were often put to be drivers. Of course, to some people these heights are still short, but unlike what many think, Western tanks like Leopard 2 and Abrams aren't really comfortable for all people. The loader's position in Leopard 2 is 1.78 meters tall from the bottom of the turret basket to the roof, and it's even shorter on Abrams where it's around 1.65 meters from the bottom of the turret basket to the roof. Of course, you will fit there easily if you are taller, but the taller you are, the less comfortable it will get. 
There were also complaints in Abrams that the taller drivers don't get enough legroom, and in Leopard 2 the height limit for the driver is 1.83 meters, which kinda goes along with the uncommon T72 driver heights. Myth number 3. Big downside of T-72's engine is that it is diesel and during war it will not be able to use other fuels like gas turbine of Abrams or T-80. Another very common misconception. People hear diesel and immediately assume it is only able to take diesel. What they don't realize is that the majority of tank diesel engines are multi-fuel. I think the biggest culprit for this myth getting popularized are the documentaries which claim how the gas turbines are great for their ability to use different types of fuel, like diesel, gasoline and even jet fuel. Well, T-72's engine can use those types of fuel too. In a T-72 manual it is stated that the engine can use diesel, gasoline or petrol, and even jet fuel, as well as any mixture of those fuels. Now, there are some limitations when using some of those fuels, like not being allowed to use the smoke screen when using gasoline, and that the gasoline shouldn't be used if the outside temperature is hotter than 25 degrees Celsius, which can be a problem for the countries operating the tanks in hot environments, but overall, the engine does support the use of different types of fuel. Myth number 4. The tanks used by Iraq in Gulf War were domestically produced Assad Babil tanks or the tanks were heavily downgraded variants of Soviet tanks. Well, this one is not true either. While there were indeed attempts made by Iraq to set up domestic production of T-72 tanks, which should have been called Assad Babil, they never achieved to do that. Only on the military exhibition did they claim that one tank was made domestically. But there is no evidence to back any of this up. Now, were they heavily downgraded export tanks? Well, not really. Rack had T-72 Ural, T-72M and T-72M1 tanks, which were procured from USSR, Czechoslovakia and Poland. All tanks were made up to standards and were not downgraded in any way. Now, the thing is, T-72 Ural was already very obsolete by that time. It originally entered service in 1973 and was largely phased out of service in USSR. T-72M tank was a mix between the T-72Euro and T-72M1, largely based on T-72Euro1, which was also obsolete. T-72M1 was pretty much one-to-one -one copy of the Soviet T-72A tank from 1979. While 12 years old at the time, and mostly replaced by much better T-72B tanks in USSR, it was still very well in active service in Soviet Union and T-72M1 as M1 was in active service with the Warsaw Pact countries and would have been heavily used by Warsaw Pact against NATO if the Cold War broke out at the time. The only difference is that the best armor-piercing ammunition the Iraqis had was the old export 3BM-17 ammunition with a steel penetrator, which was absolutely horrible and could barely do anything to any tank at the time. T-72 tanks couldn't even penetrate each other with such projectile, and we all know what the silver bullet did to T-72s. The Soviets and the Warsaw Pact would have been better prepared when it comes to ammunition. Of course, one should not disregard that the T-72A or T-72M1 was not even close to being the best USSR could offer. Tanks like T-72B and T-80U could quite reliably go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the M1A1 tanks, but just like US still operated M60 tanks at the time, USSR still operated the older T-72 variants, but still not in that small numbers, and T-72M1 was, to the very end, the best main battle tank of the Warsaw Pact countries outside of USSR. Conflict of Nations is a free online PvP strategy game happening in a modern global warfare. Click on the link in the description to get an exclusive gift, 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. The offer is only available for 30 days, so don't lose time.